Last lesson, we learned how to name ionic compounds and write formulas for ionic compounds. And now we're going to learn how to do the same for molecular compounds, which luckily is much easier than uh, with ionic compounds. So let's start with uh, nomenclature, naming molecular compounds. And again, remember that a molecular compound is made up of two nonmetal atoms. So uh, if we see that, if we see the first thing in the formula is a nonmetal, the second thing is a nonmetal, that's likely to be a molecular compound. So we name the elements in the same order as they appear in the formula. Uh, we're going to drop the last syllable and sometimes the last two, like in the case of oxygen, um, in the last element named, and then we add the suffix "-ied". So all molecular compounds end in "-ied". Uh, what's different about naming molecular compounds than ionic compounds is that in the names of molecular compounds, we use prefixes. And the prefixes tell us how many of each element there is uh, in that compound. So prefixes like mono, di, tri, tetra for four. A lot of times students mess that up. Penta, hexa, hepta, not septa, and so on. So there's a table in your book on page 175. It lists all of these prefixes. Uh, sometimes mono is not used. In fact, mono is never used at the beginning of a name. So it can be used uh, before the name of the second element, but we never put the prefix mono before the first element. Let me show you some examples. So we have carbon and oxygen. There's only one carbon, so we're going to take the name, the full name of the first element in the compound. The second element, there's two of them, so we're going to use a prefix di. And then the second element is oxygen. We're going to take off the last part of that name, oxygen, and add the "-ide suffix. So this would be oxide, so carbon. Carbon dioxide. Let's try another one. There's another oxide of carbon. This time it has a different ratio of atoms in the molecule. Let's go ahead and name this one. Again, we have just one of the first elements, so no prefix mono, so just carbon. The second element, there's just one. So sometimes uh, we use a prefix and sometimes not. I'm going to have you use a prefix always for the second element, even if there's just one. So we have one oxygen, so that's mono. Uh, here's the thing, though, a little uh, tip or a little trick. If your prefix ends in an O or an A, so that's mono and tetra and penta and so on, if your prefix ends in an O or an A and it precedes a vowel in the name of the second element, you'll drop the O or A from the prefix. So this is not carbon monoxide. We're going to drop the O from mono, and we get carbon monoxide. Let me give you a couple more to try. So go ahead and pause the video and name those compounds. So hopefully you got these. We got one phosphorus, three chlorine. So this would be phosphorus trichloride. And then the second one there, the fourth one listed on the on the slide, we have two of the first elements. So if there's two or more of the first element, then we have to use a prefix for that one. So our previous three examples, we only had one of the first elements, so we never use a prefix mono there at the beginning. So this time we're going to use a prefix di, and it's the whole name of the first element, so dinitrogen, so don't take the ending off. Dinitrogen, we have four, prefix for four is tetra. Again, we're going to drop the A from tetra, dinitrogen tetroxide. Now let's go the other way around. It's just as easy. What if I give you the name of a molecular compound? Let's write its formula. Let me show you some examples. Again, writing formulas for molecular compounds is much easier than writing formulas for ionic compounds. Everything we need to write the formula is given to us in the name. Let's take a look at this. We have sulfur hexafluoride. So according to the name, how many sulfurs are there? Well, there's just one. Second element is fluorine. How many of those? Well, hexa, the prefix hexa means six. So our chemical formula is SF6. Let's try some more. Here's a couple for you to try. Go ahead and pause the video and write the formulas for these compounds. So 
hopefully you got these. Uh, 10 is probably the highest that we'll see, so memorize 1 through 10, mono to deca. Next up, very, 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 very important for this class is knowing how to calculate molecular mass or formula mass, different names for the same thing. Uh, we call it molecular mass if what we're calculating the mass of is a molecular compound. And if it's an ionic compound, we call it formula mass. So again, the approach and how we do it is the same, just different names for different types of compounds. So molecular mass or formula mass is simply the sum of all the atomic masses of the elements in a compound. Let's take a look at some examples. Consider the compound water. Water is a molecular compound. So let's calculate the molecular mass of water, meaning the mass of one molecule of water, just one of these. All right, so here's what we're going to do. We have two hydrogens. So we want to take the mass of one hydrogen and multiply that by two. So one hydrogen atom has a mass of 1.01 AMU. So don't forget your units there. We have two of those. And we're going to add that to the mass of one oxygen. Oxygen has an atomic mass of 16.00 AMU. Uh, so we're going to do one of two things here. When you calculate formula mass or molecular mass, you can either go two decimal places or I'll let you round it to three sig figs. Either one is fine. So throughout the year in this class, we'll often express masses to three sig figs, uh, formula or molecular mass. So here I'm going to go to the correct number of significant figures, which would be two decimal places. So the molecular mass of water is 18.02 AMU. That's the mass of one water molecule. Let's try another example. Sodium chloride is an ionic compound. We have a metal with a nonmetal. And so we're going to calculate its formula mass. So again, formula mass for ionic compounds. So find sodium and chlorine on the periodic table. I'm going to do a little different this time. I'm not going to take the number straight from the periodic table. I'm going to take those atomic masses and round them to three sig figs. So one sodium atom has a mass of about 23.0 AMU. Chlorine Now go ahead and round that up to 35.5 AMU. I'm sure there's some uh, digits after the 5 on your periodic table, so that 5 will round the 4 up to a 5. Go ahead and pause the video. Calculates the formula mass of sodium chloride. So mass of one formula unit, that's one particle of an ionic compound, so one sodium and one chloride ion, is 58.5 AMU. Let's try one more. Go ahead and calculate the formula mass, zinc nitrate's an ionic compound, formula mass for zinc nitrate. Go ahead and pause the video. Be careful, make sure you account for each of the atoms in that compound. There's one zinc. There's two nitrates, so you want to split that up. Two nitrates, so each nitrate has one nitrogen. So if there's two nitrates, that's two nitrogens. That's where we get the two from. Each nitrate has three oxygens. There are two nitrates, so that's where these six oxygens come from. Add that all up, we get a mass of 189 AMU. And very, very, very important that you can calculate masses of compounds. All right, next up, we're going to do a comparison of something called an empirical formula to a regular molecular formula. Uh, so remember, a molecular formula reflects the actual ratio of elements in a compound. Uh, this thing called an empirical or simplest formula reflects the simplest ratio or smallest ratio of elements in a compound. Uh, take a look on page 179 in your textbooks. Pause the video if you need to do that. So we have two compounds, glucose and acetic acid. Uh, they both have a, the same empirical formula. The simplest formula for the compound is CH2O.
However, glucose has a molecular formula of C6H12O6. Whereas acetic acid has a chemical formula of C2H4. Sorry, C2H4O2. So same simplest formula, but very different molecular formulas. And as you can see in the table there, these compounds are extremely different. So though it is possible for two compounds to have the same empirical formula, it is not possible for two compounds, two different compounds, to have the same molecular formula. Let's take a look at some other examples. The molecular formula for this compound is C6H12. What would be its empirical formula? So the actual ratio of carbon atoms to hydrogen atoms is 6 to 12. Can we simplify that? So if we take these subscripts and reduce them to the lowest whole number ratio, we'll get the empirical formula, which in this case is CH2. Let's take a look at another example. The molecular formula for hydrogen peroxide is H2O2. We have a 2 to 2 ratio of hydrogen to oxygen atoms. Notice... We have a compound like water that's made of hydrogen and oxygen, but this time we have instead of a 2 to 1 ratio like in water, we have a 2 to 2 ratio. Uh, what is the empirical formula for hydrogen peroxide? We reduce that ratio, 2 to 2 ratio, to the lowest whole number. We get a 1 to 1 ratio. Empirical formula is HO. Let's try one more. The, I don't want to call it molecular formula because it's not a molecular compound. The chemical formula for magnesium chloride is MgCl2. What is the empirical formula for magnesium chloride? It should be noted that the chemical formula for an ionic compound shows the smallest whole number ratio of ions in the compound therefore is an empirical formula, so always for ionic compounds. Uh, molecular compounds, their chemical formulas may or may not be uh, empirical formulas. So let's say you are given the empirical formula of a compound and you're asked to determine the molecular formula. How would you do that? So you need to be able to go from empirical formula to molecular formula and vice versa, the former being more important than the latter. Here's how it works. The molecular formula for a compound may be determined if the empirical formula is known and the molecular mass is known. So if you're given both of those pieces of information, you can find the molecular formula. Let's take a look at some examples. Suppose a compound has an empirical formula of CH2O and a molecular mass of 180 AMU. What is the molecular formula for this compound? All right, so here's what we do. First thing is we need to calculate something called empirical formula mass, which is the mass of the empirical formula. Let me uh, rearrange some of the stuff on the slide. So first step here is we're going to calculate the empirical formula mass. Uh, mass of one carbon, two hydrogens, one oxygen. So that's 12 plus 2, that's 14 plus 16, is about 30 AMU. Now remember, the molecular formula for a compound is a whole number multiple of the empirical formula. So remember, the empirical formula is a reduced form. If we go the other way around, a molecular formula is a multiple of the empirical formula. So what we need to find is that multiple. To do that, we're going to take the molecular mass, which is given to us in this problem, divided by the empirical formula mass, which we needed to calculate, and we get our multiplier. So what this means is this.
the molecular formula for the compound is six times as massive as the empirical formula. So we're going to take each of the subscripts in the empirical formula and this time multiply each by six. We get C6H12O6. All right, let's try another one. I'll be sure to show all the work just like I did on the previous slide. Uh, for this one, we have an empirical formula, P2O5. The molecular mass is 284 AMU. Use that information to find the molecular formula. Go ahead and pause the video. So the empirical formula mass or the mass of the empirical formula is 142 AMU. That tells us that the molecular formula is twice as massive as the empirical formula. So we get P4O10. Let's try another. A compound has an empirical formula of CH3 and a molecular mass of 30 AMU. Go ahead and determine the molecular formula. Pause the video. So we calculate the empirical formula mass to be about 15 AMU. 30 AMU divided by 15 AMU, we get 2 again. So again, our molecular formula is twice the empirical formula. Take a look at another. A compound has a molecular formula, sorry, empirical formula, a CH. A molecular mass of 78 AMU. Go ahead and determine the molecular formula of this compound. Pause the video. Mass of the empirical formula, about 13 AMU. Take our molecular mass, 78, divided by 13, and we get 6, which tells us the molecular formula is 6 times the empirical formula. So we get C6H6. Let's try one more. The empirical formula of a compound is C3H8. It has a molecular mass of 44 AMU. Find the molecular formula. The mass of the empirical formula is 44 AMU. When we divide those, we get 1. That means the compound's molecular formula is the same as its empirical formula. So that happens sometimes. But as we saw in the previous example, that's not always the case. All right, that wraps up this unit. Uh, please let me know if you have any questions. We can go over any of these that you want in class. Thanks for watching.